Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Good afternoon, dear audience. Thank you for coming to the Dutch Pavilion. A big welcome to the guests coming from abroad and the guests uh, worldwide back in the Netherlands and wherever you have decided to log in. Welcome to the Circular Economy Thought Series, the first of many, hopefully. Distinguished guests, I think it's fair to say that this is the most circular pavilion at the Dubai Expo. It is, right? Yes, I see people nodding that know more than I do. A few years ago, this place was sand. And a few months after Expo is finished, it will be sand again. We're going to give everything back to nature and to the UAE. Just give you a couple of examples. The sheet piles you see there. We have almost three and a half kilometers of sheet piles used for the construction of this pavilion, including the foundation, which I'm not an engineer like yourself, but I've been told that that's actually quite revolutionary. In the UAE, normally it's built with concrete. This is built with sheet piles. Just another example, like just step with your feet on the ground. That's mushroom. So that is seriously organic and circular. And it's not only here, it's also on the walls. If you look later in, the, in front of the bar, these are just a couple of examples of the material that have been used to make a very circular economy-based pavilion because we want to show to the UAE and the world what the Netherlands stand for. We, the Netherlands, I say, like I represent the Dutch government, but I especially like to welcome the Dutch private sector. We've deliberately kept it in a small group today because it's a very special group for us. I see a lot of familiar faces from Dutch companies that are based here in the UAE, and they want to contribute to make the UAE uh, an even better place, more sustainable and more climate friendly, and it's called the Dutch Sustainability Group. I had the pleasure to be at the founding moment with the pre previous Minister of Climate Change, His Excellency uh, Dr. Thani El Zayudi, in Abu Dhabi, I'm always struggling with Corona, when this was, uh, it was January 2020. 19. 19, you see, I struggle since Corona, I have lost track, but this was in January 2019 in Abu Dhabi at the Dutch Pavilion. It wasn't a very sustainable pavilion to be honest, compared to this pavilion. Uh, at the trade fair, we opened, um, we launched the Dutch Sustainability Group in the presence of the, um, the minister. And the idea of the Dutch Sustainability Group is really to um, to gather and to share knowledge, to learn from each other and to learn from the UAE and to see where we can complement each other. And that's where I'm proud of, that we as the government can try to link all of you and see what kind of difference we can make. And it's great to do this in the circular pavilion. Just want to ask you to look around and see uh, the roof there, that's where we generate our energy from the solar roof. On the top you can't see it, but we harvest our own water and then we grow our own food because the theme of this pavilion is uniting water, energy and food in a circular way. So welcome to the Dutch Pavilion. I would like to give the floor to um, Mr. Freek van Eyck. He is an expert on circular economy in the Netherlands. He heads the Holland Circular Hotspot, and he will be guiding us through the, um, through the early evening afternoon session we have today. So thank you very much all for coming, and I'm handing over the floor to uh, Mr. Trek. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Ambassador. Thank you, Daoud. A warm welcome in this award-winning pavilion also on behalf of me. I'm CEO of Holland Circular Hotspot and proud to be your moderator today. It's a special moment in time uh, because the world is recovering from COVID-19 and the world needs actually circular economy more than ever. There's more awareness, there are uh, recovery funds, and most of the recovery funds are for 40% sustainable, including circular economy. And this is the first of more series. Uh, now the series are organized by the, ambas the, the embassy and the consulate uh, of the Netherlands by the Dutch Sustainability Group, of which we'll hear more soon, by NL and Business, the Netherlands Business Council, and by Holland uh, Circular Hotspot. Um, today, we hope to define next steps together in, uh, towards circular economy. Uh, we will learn about uh, your policy plan today, so we're honored to have you with us. 
And we'll also hear from the Vice Minister of the Netherlands, Roald Lapeer, about the Dutch path to circular economy. And we learned the hard way, so we hope that you can leapfrog. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel with a great setup in which we do a deep dive in a number of topics. Energy mobility, energy and lighting, and also nasty discussions about EPR and plastics and packaging. Very interesting topic, and it's really a, a topic with momentum. Um, we thought we need some, before we do deep dives and breakout tables, we do something nice. And we can't bring, uh, let's say, you to the Netherlands, but we can bring the Netherlands to you. So we have a nice, immersive di digital experience for you. It's the Dutch Virtual Gateway. It's an experience that's designed, uh, developed, and offered by NL and Business. So, so we'll see more about it later. We love interactivity. Uh, we hope that the people here in the room uh, speak up, ask questions after the panel. And for you at home, we have a chat function, and we'll make sure that your voice is heard as well. Um, first things first, who are the real heroes of a circular economy? Those are the companies. They invest, they show guts, and they're responsible for scaling up. And we have a wonderful group of companies here, the Dutch Sustainability Group. But who are they? What do they do? I'd like to introduce uh, you to Stephanie Schachsabo, to the host initiator, spokesperson for the Dutch Stability Group. Who are they? What's their power? Stephanie. What's our power? That's a really nice sentence. Thank you very much, Preek. Your Excellency, it's wonderful to have you with us here today and to see so many of my members here. It's today, it's a very intimate setting and we are very happy as the Dutch Sustainability Group to have like also an intimate discussion with you like on the policies, as Frank said. Like the Dutch Sustainability Group, I think, Dawa, you were right. It was January 2020, and I was mistaken. Like the, the corona has mixed our, mixed our uh, uh, feeling of years, actually. But the Dutch Sustainability Group, um, we formed like in January 2020 at the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week in the presence of uh, His Excellency, former Minister of Climate Change and Environment. We were very proud to have the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment so much involved in this initiative by the Dutch private sector because we have wonderful multinationals that are established also here in the UAE that have sustainability at their core of their strategy. And like to unite the Dutch business community within the Dutch Sustainability Group to really bring innovative projects and and innovative ideas and thought leaderships to the circular economy as well as the sustainability in, in general, it's important for us. It's in the heart of our uh, core business. So I'm very happy that today we are joined by, um, Lise Plan is one of our members, like KLM is one of our proud members, like our Royal Dutch Airline. We have Friesland Campina, like uh, uh, who is joining us for the for today, as well as Signify and Unilever. So those companies today will be the companies that will discuss with you these important topics. And I'm very happy that we're kicking off this circular economy thought leadership today together in this room and with all the people from the Netherlands. So thank you very much, enjoy the day. And I'm happy to hand over to Freek again. Now, we're going to discuss the policy in the UAE and the Dutch policy. And for, in January 2021, the United Arab Emirates circular economy policy was launched. Uh, we have a special guest to uh, elaborate on all the details. Can I invite you to the stage, uh, His Excellency, Aisha Ab Abdoli. Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to address you uh, today on behalf of the UAE Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. I would like to thank the organizers, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, UAE Dutch Sustainability Group, and Holland Circular, a hotspot for organizing this first event of the series. It's an honor to join you today to speak about UAE circular economy policy, uh, which has been uh, launched in January 2021. 
In recent years, the concept of uh, mainstreaming sustainability and pursuit of uh, green economic practices have emerged as strategic priorities for many governments and intergovernmental organizations. Um, as a young nation, UAE has always been proud of how the country has transformed from a barren desert to a land of opportunities for both its citizens and residents. Rapid economic growth and being a melting pot of global talents have brought significant prosperity and improved the quality of life in UAE, despite the challenges brought by the harsh desert conditions that we have in here. As we continue the momentum and further accelerate progress to remain globally competitive, we equally acknowledge the need to ensure that development happens in a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient manner. And we still have a long way to go in this regard. This vision resonates even stronger with the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic as we strive to build back better and come out stronger from the crisis. Therefore, governments are now in the process of formulating and implementing their national recovery plans. Integration of climate-related uh, considerations will be, of course, critical in building resilience against the future disruptions of this magnitude in combating the global climate crisis. So as part of the climate action and the green recovery, UAE government is currently updating the UAE Green Agenda 2030 programs as part of the country's effort to achieve SDG goals and climate commitments. We are very proud to have witnessed the adoption of UAE circular economy policy by UAE cabinet earlier this year, which represents a new landmark and phase for UAE that would lead for sure regionally and one of the pioneer countries globally on supporting transition towards circular economy. UAE now uh, is on its way to achieve strategic objectives on the new economy and the circular economy will be an integral part of that journey which will support the transformation of UAE over the next 50 years. Uh, we realize that for the next step, there is a great need to educate and train as many companies in UAE on various aspects of the circular economy, including opportunities, profitability, and sustainability. So firstly, we are aiming through UAE Circular Economy Council to support the successful implementation of the policy with a support from a newly established expert committee. And to achieve that, we will utilize our international partnerships with the World Economic Forum that was signed earlier in 2019 and with Intensa Sao Paulo Group signed in 2020. Secondly, various educational and training programs will be launched in the coming months in cooperation with the private sector and the new international partnerships will be formed as we are following closely on the latest technological and policy advancement in advanced countries. Also, the Ministry of Economy will be leading the path in coordination with local entities and the private sector to attract foreign direct investment in the four priority sectors of sustainable manufacturing, green infrastructure, sustainable transportation, and sustainable food production and consumption. Even here at Expo 2020, we can easily find many examples that demonstrate the implementation of the circular economy, especially here in the sustainability district. So Expo 2020 is expected to be one of the most sustainable world expos ever. Uh, ever, where sustainability is integrated in many aspects from buildings, construction, to water consumption, tourism, and waste reduction. And Your Excellency, what you had shared with us today with the construction of this great pavilion is a showcase for, um, for, 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 for this aspect. 
As we are moving forward towards building back better, we should never lose sight of the importance of circular economy as part of the post-pandemic green recovery strategy. As more economies start to open up and achieve a certain level of normalcy, we should seize this opportunity for a fresh start by doing things better. And that involves embracing circular economy both as a mindset and as a way of life. Thank you very much for listening. And again, it's a pleasure to be with you here and today. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Make yourself comfortable. You spoke about uh, the, the new policy. I think congratulations for your initiative. You have the right to be proud. I heard you speak about the Circular Economy Council, expert committee, training programs, uh, international partnerships. Well, that would be very interesting. Four priority sectors, and of course, this beautiful expo which you have here as a showcase. Uh, um, before we do a deep dive with all the specialist companies here in the room, we have a contribution from our ministry, and we'll see a video from our vice minister. Uh, before we see the video, I have a message to the, the, the guests at home. Um, if you want to join the chat, if you want to ask questions, you will see on, the, on your screen that on the left side you will see a small orange block with an arrow in it. Click on that one and you can ask questions. Uh, at the top of your screen, on the right, you can click chat to join the designated chat area. Let's have a video. A very good afternoon to every one of you. And let me start by saying that I'm very happy to join your meeting today. Uh, join your meeting because we believe circularity is very important and because we are very proud and very glad to see what is happening on this subject already in the UAE and in the broader Gulf region. I personally visited uh, Mazdar City many years ago, was impressed about what had been put into, uh, into work there already, but also impressed by the fact that, for example, the UAE has established a circular economy council, showing how important also in your country, in your region, this subject is. And of course, circularity is a goal that is closely connected to three planetary crises the world is facing right now climate change, biodiversity loss, as well as the issue of pollution. And just to reiterate how important the circular economy is, I would like to indicate that almost 50% of all CO2 emissions are related to material use and material extraction. So we cannot deal with climate change without embracing the circular economy. 90% of all biodiversity loss is related to material extraction and material use. So also dealing with biodiversity loss means embracing the circular economy. And the same is the case, of course, for pollution, because pollution is a serious issue all around the world, in my region as well as in yours. And by embracing a circular economy, we can deal with that as well. In our country, in the Netherlands, we've put quite bold targets 50% of raw material reduction for uh, all materials we use and also a full circularity in 2050. So we really hope by putting such bold targets that we put something in motion. But we also translate that into so-called transition agendas. And we believe they're important because they put our larger goal into practice on plastics, on industrial goods, on material use, but also, for example, on biomass and food, as well as on, uh, on building uh, materials. This is important because it puts into practice a broader target. We also think we have quite a number of very interesting and hopefully inspiring examples. We, for an example, have a company that can completely recycle even contaminated metals contaminated with asbestos or contaminated with other substances of very high concern. That was impossible until only very recently, but now it can be done. Uh, when you visit Schiphol Airport, you'll see the lighting that is leased, not bought, but leased, which really makes it circular. Everything in the lighting there is circular. And 
there are several other examples. The biggest Dutch seller of soft drinks now only has 100% bad bottles. And I'm sure in your country, a lot of comparable examples are there already, or at least in the making. And I hope you will use this meeting to share ideas with each other, how also your region can become more circular and hopefully we can learn from this ourselves. So I wish you a great meeting. I hope you will be inspired and inspire each other. Have a great meeting and have a great evening. Here, here, Vice Minister Roald Laper from the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. We're a tiny country in a very vulnerable position. By having a collaborative approach, we managed to have our economy viable and our country livable. And we think that if we can do that, certainly the UAE can, uh, can, can do that as well. We'll now have a panel where we go deeper into discussion. I gladly invite uh, to the table Her Excellency Aisha Al Abdulli. I invite Mr. Ajay Narain from Leesplan Emirates, uh, General Manager and Country Manager Head at Leesplan Emirates. Mr. Shanyif Kakar, Executive Vice President of Unilever. Please proceed to the, the table. Virtually with us is Mr. Hari Verhaar. He is the Global Di Director, Regulatory and Governmental Affairs of Signify, and we'll see him virtually on our right, on your left. Welcome, distinguished panel. I will start with you, Her Your Excellency. We, we have been speaking about uh, the circular economy. The Dutch, sustainability, sustainable, the Dutch Sustainability Group is focusing today on two topics, uh, the topics of energy and the topics of plastics and packaging. We would be delighted if you could elaborate a little bit more on your future vision on especially those topics. Uh, uh, what are the plans specifically for the next five years? What would you expect from them? How can they help you to realize your plans? Uh, um, please, can I give you the floor? Thank you for this question. It's really important to highlight uh, these points. So UAE vision for a circular economy includes a vision where energy is actually used as efficiently and productively as possible. So that will be implemented in all sectors of economy. So this means that we want to see more economic and social value being created for every kilowatt or kilojoule that is consumed. And uh, we want to make sure that we want to see more clean and renewable energy being used and more energy being recovered from waste as well. So there are already several um, practices and examples in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, and in Sharjah of initiating the plants uh, to transfer or to divert the, uh, the waste to be energy that can be used in several sectors. And that will prevent the waste from being dumped at the landfill. Uh, okay, uh, also to support improved energy efficiency and productivity, the government is supporting the development of um, energy service companies, district cooling, and research and development into technology and business models. Uh, the government is also investing a lot in renewable and uh, green technologies such as the green hydrogen to tackle the harder um, way of abating uh, the um, energy demands such as those in the industrial, shipping and aviation sector. Uh, likewise, the government is also planning to invest in smart and sustainable public transport system that will reduce energy demands as well as improve the air quality by reducing the pollutants that are um, emitted to the air. That when it comes to the energy part. So when we Thank are you. to, uh, mm -hmm. shall we proceed to yes, the plastic? Yes, please, yeah. uh, how is it with plastics? Yeah, uh, so when we speak about the plastic and packaging, UAE's vis uh, vision in this regard is to reduce uh, to an absolute minimum, since too much packaging and plastics ends up as waste. Um, to tackle the plastic waste, for example, Abu Dhabi announced a policy that bans single-use plastics, and this policy aims to encourage the use of uh, reusable bags and introduce a fine of using plastics that have sustainable alternatives. Uh, 
Uh, another example, we can say that UAE views the plastic waste as a design problem. We need to design products and systems where waste is designed out, and this could be through new materials that are biodegradable or long, longer lasting. Uh, there are many opportunities to develop these new design and materials that design out waste, whether that waste is a plastic or some other material. So the government is actually exploring uh, what regulations needed and uh, what in economic incentives also are needed, and that could be in a place to support the reduction in waste and the development of a new business models. Thank you so much. I think that uh, ask actually for a reaction from your counterparts. Uh, Mr. Narain, could you vi give your vision on energy in relation to mobility? Why is it so important to focus on energy and mobility? What opportunities do you see? And maybe share some best practices uh, you have in the region. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Frick. And, uh, uh, but before I start, I'd like to just uh, 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 thank uh, uh, Holland Hotspot in particular for uh, moderating the event, uh, the Dutch Embassy and the, uh, the Dutch Consulate for organizing the event and of course uh, the great group that we have, the Dutch Sustainability Group for uh, sort of bringing together so many uh, people of uh, eminence as far as sustainability is concerned and uh, also His, uh, Her Excellency uh, Aisha Abdulli for uh, being on this panel. It's a privilege to be with you on this panel and also my colleague Sanjeev uh, for being on the panel. Uh, <clears throat> to start with, well, uh, your question, Frank, well, mobility, of course, is very important, right? It's, uh, it's key to our lives uh, for, as far as uh, it leads to efficient and quality uh, movement of uh, people and, uh, and goods. Sure. Right? Yeah. So it's actually uh, leading to economic growth, providing us with livelihoods also has a psychosocial impact because it allows us to travel and meet people. Right? So mobility in itself is, is very important. Now, as far as the relevance of uh, energy is concerned, uh, as, uh, in terms of uh, uh, mobility, uh, what we have uh, noticed is that the uh, requirement for fossil fuel-based energy has been increasing. Increasing because of the rising population and also because with a rising population, you have more uh, transportation needs and you have more building needs. Right? So, <clears throat> and then uh, of course, uh, in the next uh, 10 years, it's forecasted that uh, mobility needs would have to increase by 70%. Seven uh, zero. Seven zero. Right, that's massive. Yes, yep. whereas on, on, the, on the flip side, we know that we are uh, faced with the challenge of climate change where we can't go beyond the threshold of 1.5 degrees centigrade, right? And uh, so that actually requires the automotive industry to reduce its emissions by 50%. So that is what I normally call the mobility paradox, right? So on the one hand, there's an increased need for mobility. On the other, there's an increased need to reduce uh, emissions, right? But uh, of course, uh, that paradox uh, can be resolved. So. And before I, I move to more circular practices, I think one of the most important things to, to resolve this uh, paradox that we're faced with, right? Because uh, it will, of course, if we're able to resolve it, it will re uh, result in a reduction of the carbon emissions, is uh, that it's time for many uh, countries, right, and many governments to realize that climate change is a threat, right? Uh, and it's time to put uh, the words into action. So, so that is very important, right? So for instance, uh, uh, if I think uh, many countries need to emulate the UAE, right? So where uh, recently an announcement has been made that the net emissions by 2050 would be zero, right? So, so I think there is a basis to emulate the UAE, right? Uh, and also there is a requirement that not only governments but corporates also need to, uh, need to realize the importance and work with governments, right, as partners in policy making and policy implementation, right? Because uh, of course there have been recent announcements, the UK announcing a ban on sale of ICE vehicles by 2030, uh, uh, President Biden in the US making a similar announcement, 
Not acting will not be possible, I assume. Sorry? We need to act. Uh, not acting, yeah, there is absolutely. too much momentum. Yeah. So, so, uh, so there, actually, so, so there is a, a case, right? So to, and in the mobility sector, we really need to come up with policies that drive electric mobility. And talking about, of course, electrification, it will lead to an increase in the consumption of electricity, so we need to address that. As Her Excellency was just saying, we need to look at possibly renewable sources of energy, right, as a, as, as, as a possibility to address the increased electric consumption, that we, electricity consumption that will be required. Uh, I think that the UAE actually is well placed because as for the uh, national energy strategy of 2050, right? Uh, that uh, I think 50% of the uh, of the total po installed power capacity will be uh, driven by either nuclear or solar, right? In the in the UAE, and I think uh, that that is something that uh, we would need to uh, look at, right? And of course, technology and digitization will also play an in in increasing role. Uh, for instance, uh, we as Lease Plan globally have developed an app called Lease Plan Energy, right? And what that app does, and it's in the testing phase in the Netherlands. The final words, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm just <laughs> finishing. So uh, it actually uh, uh, enables individuals to charge when the generation of uh, renewable energy is abundant. So you can charge your electric vehicle when it's abundant. Uh, coming to circularity, of course, uh, mm. is also uh, uh, equally important, right, circular practices within mobility, like we are driving the reusability of vehicles, right, so leasing in itself is a circular concept, right, and we're driving the reus reusability of, uh, of uh, vehicles. Uh, when vehicles finish their first leasing cycle, we are actually releasing uh, vehicles again, right, and we've also tied up with many of the technology platforms like you drive eCar in the UAE, uh, driving uh, the re multiple use of, of the same vehicle, which keeps vehicles off so the road. Digitization, uh, cars as a mobility as a service, reusability, yeah. yes. and electrification. Abs absolutely, and then uh, coming to the wow. end, right, is hmm. uh, integrated mobility also will, hmm. will be an important thing, hmm. where cities will need to design their hmm. uh, mobility uh, visions, right? So whether it be integration f with different modes of transport, Right, like private cars, robo taxis, oh. robo shuttles, mm -hmm. micro mobility, cycles, walking, right, on the one hand, and on the other, they'll have to align it with the uh, different concepts of mobility, like uh, autonomous uh, driving, connectivity, electrification, shared mobility, right, and of course, uh, as we've, uh, as uh, uh, it was mentioned by the wise minister, right, uh, uh, another concept is uh, the you can come, come up with different concepts of urban planning like uh, smart cities or 10-minute uh, neighborhoods or 20-minute neighborhoods, right? And examples are Masdar City and uh, the sustainable city in Dubai. Right? So I think there are a lot of opportunities as far as the, future the is exciting, mix, definitely. Right? <laughs> as far as the optimal mix of energy and the use of energy is concerned, right? But it's time to put uh, your words into action. Thank you very much for your contribution, your generous contribution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I feel very passionate about sustainability. No, I, I recognize it immediately. <laughs> yeah. I applaud you for that. <laughs> Let's move to another person who I know is very passionate about this topic, and that is Harry Vahar. Uh, he is virtually traveling to us from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, Harry, let's talk about energy in relation to lighting. Um, please build on, on the story of Liesplan. Uh, why is this topic so relevant? Uh, why is lighting so relevant? And what opportunities do you see? Which bridges can you build? The floor is yours, Harry. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Freik. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to join, be it virtual. I think we're all dying to see people in 3D again. And I hope to be in, in the Emirates uh, soon. Uh, so there are two important uh, ways actually building on the remarks of the Vice Ministers and, and, and of Ajay. And <clears throat> that's where lighting can contribute. So the first is on efficiency. Uh, the whole transition to LED lighting offers a massive efficiency opportunity. And secondly, the fact that lighting is going digital. So on efficiency, it's just over a decade ago that lighting was responsible for 19%, almost one-fifth of global electricity consumption. 
at the moment is down to like 12, 13 percent through because of this whole transition. And we foresee that in 2030 can be down to 8 percent. But at the same time, we use one third more lighting. So there's more people, more urban infrastructure, uh, so more lighting service being consumed. And so you see a clear decoupling between consumption and uh, let's say the, the service uh, that it provides. But secondly, lighting is going digital. So already at this moment, all of the LED lighting we put on the market, and for 85% we have now converted to LED lighting, uh, is I either IoT connected or connectable. And this means that for parts in technology, we're looking how to make lighting circular, so make it modular, circular ready. Also how to move to 3D printed luminaires, which themselves also have like half the footprint. So we design new business models, like lighting as a service. And the ambassador already mentioned skip on lighting, you don't need to buy the hardware, you just lease the service. So as much as uh, that you use per month, and that is what you pay for. And the fact that lighting is digital also allows exact tracking and monitoring uh, through an interact platform that we've created. Uh, let's say the exact uh, functioning. So the working hours, the electricity consumption, the carbon content of the electricity. So in that sense, you see a real uh, leapfrog to new technologies. And what is interesting also looking at the, at the electric vehicle challenge is that we normally we know how that lighting of the buildings are responsible for 40% of energy consumption, but they're also responsible for two thirds of electricity consumption and 85% of the electricity consumption for lighting. And we see in order to meet climate goals, we need to more than double renovation rates of infrastructure to 3% per year, uh, because that contributes like half uh, to, towards staying within the 1.5 centigrade uh, limit. But also by doing this, and this is really, really important, we free up, you could say, a massive amount of electricity that can be allocated to accelerating the electric vehicle uh, revolution. So in that sense, then you would need to invest less, uh, less capital in, in building new uh, power generation, which also time-wise and, 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 and capital requirements uh, would be a huge challenge. So you see there's a clear link between the two, and that is also why I applaud the good work of Lisbon. Thank you, Harry. So you save the energy that others can use in the energy transition. That seems like a, like a, a very nice move. Uh, um, let's go to our last panel, panel member. I didn't do you right. You are uh, Sanjeev Kakar, Unilever, Middle East, North Africa, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Turkey. We are modest in your presence. Uh, but you have a great topic to deal with. The world is talking about plastics, risk momentum, and your company is highly involved in plastics and packaging. What role does, uh, does Unilever want to play in the future of plastics here in the, in the Emirates? So uh, first of all, um, thanks for having me here and uh, really a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, about 12 years ago, Unilever uh, articulated a vision which said we want to decouple our environmental impact from growth. And that was a bold vision because basically it said that even if we double our business, uh, you know, we are not going to increase our environmental impact uh, on the way. And that was enshrined in the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which then began to set out multi-year goals in terms of what we wish to achieve. Um, before I come to plastics, just a, a couple of other areas, picking up on some of the thoughts that have uh, that have emerged. I think the. The first thing that happened around 2013 was uh, the fact that we became globally a zero la waste to landfill company, including in the UAE. And all our waste today uh, from our factories and office sites is, uh, is, is, does not go to the landfill. It's either uh, converted, it's composted, uh, or, it's, or it's just recycled uh, within, uh, within, the, within the factory or, or with third parties. Already today. Yes, so that's been happening now for the last eight years uh, in all our manufacturing sites uh, and sourcing units and, uh, and, and offices globally. Um, all the factories that are now being set up, for instance, if you take the Dubai personal care factory, which we set up uh, about four years ago, are now what we would call green factories. So the Dubai personal care factory was the first one where we, one third of our power generation is through solar installed by us around the factory premises. Mm -hmm. And uh, so out of the nine megawatts that we use in a year, about three comes out of our own solar panels which have been put there. 80% uh, of the water inside is recycled. 
A lot of daylight is used to, to light up the factories. Um, there are some real improvements that have happened in terms of carbon emissions, heat energy usage, et cetera. So uh, a lot of work happening on the, on the supply chain side. We're not even sure. talking about plastics yet. Yeah, we're not even talking about plastics. Um, plastics. Now, plastics, I just want to say, is not an enemy. It is an integral part of you know, the human consumption society, and, and, and it is a very useful part. The thing about plastics is not to put it in the environment, but to keep it in the loop. Uh, and I think uh, as a company, we obviously use a lot of plastic, and a lot of our packaging goes into that. Um, a lot of our products uh, are, 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 of course, packed through that. So we set some pretty ambitious goals for ourselves, which we are working towards. Uh, the first we said was that by 25, 100% of our uh, of our packaging should be recyclable, reusable, uh, compostable. Uh, and we, for instance, in the MENA region today, we are at about the 75% mark, and you know, building up rapidly to get to the 100% by 25. Uh, we also said that uh, uh, that's not enough. We just we want to also make sure that in our packaging that we are putting out, 25% is, is recycled uh, consumer PCR. Uh, so, so that we are reducing our usage of virgin uh, plastic. And, and the intention is to half the usage of virgin plastic over time. Um, and finally, a very ambitious goal, which I, I, I still struggle with how I'm going to achieve it, and I'll come to that, is about we are going to collect more than we put out into the environment. And when we collect it, then it's going to go into, into the whole recycling space. Uh, which brings me uh, to, to the big point I want to make, which is that all of this, particularly the last one, and the one about incorporation of PCR, cannot happen without relevant partnerships. Yeah? And we need the governments involved. We need the consumers involved. We need the waste collection uh, management systems involved. We then need people who can, who can take that plastic being collected and convert it into, into, into PCR, which can go into our, into our products. Uh, to that end, a number of initiatives uh, which we are taking. Uh, the first is, of course, we are part of Project Circle along with, uh, with the ministry uh, and, uh, and a few other big partners. And the intention is to begin to create the ecosystem and help drive the ecosystem that is going to enable circularity as far as plastics is concerned. We've also signed an MOU with, uh, with BIA, which is one of the largest uh, plastic collectors uh, within the UAE, uh, for uh, production of uh, PCR. Because our challenge today is that even if you want to use PCR in our products, there's just not enough available locally. And the last thing we want to be doing is importing somebody else's PCR right. <laughs> into the UAE. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's just not, not, not the right thing to do. So, um, but there, the issue really is that, you know, BIA and similar providers need a certain scale for them to put in the capital investment, which is where the governments can come in, private sector partnership can come in, like-minded companies can come in to make sure that we are able to generate the right. Uh, can only be right a collaborative scale. effort. It if can you only want be to scale. a collaborative effort. Then we do a number of other things like setting up uh, reverse vending machines, partnership with schools to raise awareness, and all of that kind of work happens. But really the big thing that has to happen is this uh, full ecosystem has to be built uh, across, uh, across the whole chain uh, for us to really be able to make a difference on a substantial scale for the UAE to reach its goals. Uh, it's, it's not going to be just enough for one or two companies to try and do this on their own. Thank you, Mr. Kakar. So we've heard now three panelists from the Dutch Sustainability Group elaborating on their passion, on their field of uh, their topic. Um, I'm really interested to hear your opinion. Uh, how we will proceed now is that we will have three, call it power duets, that we have uh, three sessions between, uh, between uh, His Excellency Aisha and uh, the pan other panel members. Uh, first reaction from you in one minute, and then a reaction from the panelists. Uh, uh, can we start on the topic of energy and mobility, please? Could you share your, your thoughts? I believe that what we heard today is really uh, of a great experiences because that proved to us that we have really a very mature 
private sector and we have potential momentum here in UAE uh, that make the private sector moving toward uh, adopting such uh, sustainable practices. If I go to one of the uh, priorities that had been highlighted in the policy, which is about the sustainable transportation, for example, in that one, our focus will be about low carbon vehicles, uh, green integrated intermodal plans, and public transport uh, and sharing models. This is very much aligned with what had already shared with Mr. Uh, by Mr. Ajay today regarding the mobility, and I believe that this is really very important in, um, I would say, having more meat mm -hmm. in a place to enrich the policy implementation. So I would congratulate them for the great efforts they are putting in a place. And we are looking forward, actually, to have more and more practices and uh, projects in this regard. Thank you so much. Ajay, Mr. Narain, would you like to react, please? So actually, it's quite encouraging to, to hear uh, 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 Her Excellency uh, saying such things. It's music to ears, right? So, and of course, uh, uh, you'll be proud to, to hear that as, uh, as a UAE company, we, we already have 7% of our fleet as sustainable within the UAE. So we are trying to sort of move ahead, and as you said, uh, there are uh, we have put in place a lot of practices in order to move to more uh, uh, to, uh, to a more sustainable model, and uh, it, it is indeed very uh, encouraging to hear that the, we are quite aligned with also the objectives of, of the UAE government. Right? And of course, uh, if at any juncture uh, you you would uh, like to uh, sort of pick on our brains, well, we are there to help. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Engineer Aisha, would you like to comment on the topic of energy and lighting? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because, you know, what, uh, what I thought that my mind was actually somewhere else when uh, Ajay was talking, because uh, maybe I didn't share with you that already the net zero announcement was made uh, mm -hmm. just last week here mm -hmm. in UAE, and that it makes us uh, the first country in the Middle East and North Africa to announce such a target, such I would say a bold target in bringing our emissions to zero by 2050. And the focus of that will be very much aligned with like the lightning industry, especially because one of the streams we are focusing on is industry. And uh, in industry, we are focusing more on innovative technologies that will actually reduce the emissions. So what we heard today from our colleague regarding the lightning that had uh, that had really, you know, uh, aligned with what had been already announced within the net zero announcement. Mm -hmm. The second sector that the net zero announcement had is uh, the energy, and the third one is transportation, and the fourth one is actually environment that includes the emissions from the waste and uh, from the agricultural sector, plus how we can absorb these emissions in the carbon sinks mm -hmm. by planting more mangroves and having more uh, sinks to absorb all of those carbon. So I'm, I'm happy to see that what had been already shared today with us uh, is aligned both with the circular economy policy and also with the net zero roadmap that had been announced uh, just last week. Over to you, uh, Harry, in, uh, in Eindhoven for, for a reaction and linking it to lighting. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for the last uh, vice versa of Her Excellency Aisha al uh, So we have a good experience uh, working also with, the, let's say, in, in the Middle East. I remember also that project said that we, that we execute with, uh, with DEWA, with the, the, let's say, the Dubai Energy and Water Authority. So I'm confident that a lot can be done on the net zero targets. I think also there, then, a, a quick reflection is that it's important to realize how do we spend our time. And I believe that in what I call the 10 20 70 rule. So 10% of our time we should dedicate on inspiration. So like we do today, inspiring people and what better future can be created and how to do that. 20% of our time on what I call aspiration. So how much needs to be done by when and by whom. 
But then 70% of our time we should spend on perspiration. So rolling up our sleeves and getting the job done. And I think there are so projects here like, um, like indeed changing all the lighting to connected lighting in, in the Emirates, but also adopting programs, have walk the talk programs on adopting electric car fleets for ministries and, and let's say for local public stakeholders and, and so forth. So it, it's really now relevant to identify concrete projects and lighting for schools, uh, for different building segments, because it are those building blocks that will actually help us deliver on the net zero target, but also that will help improve, uh, the, let's say economically at different levels, uh, but also will help us improve quality of life uh, of the people in the Emirates. Thank you, Harry. 10% inspiration, 20% aspiration, and 70% perspiration. I will remember that one. Uh, we turn to Mr. Mr. Kakar. Um, well, uh, we turn to uh, the topic of plastics, actually. We turn to you, Your Excellency. You've heard from, uh, from Unilever that they're walking the talk, that they're willing to make an action. They do a lot, but they can't do it alone. It's really a collaborative act for, and they also need government. Uh, would you like to react in, uh, in a minute, please, to the topic of plastics? Sure. So actually, to, to react on what uh, our colleague, Mr. Sanjeev, has said uh, from Unilever, uh, we have to um, mention that already one of the aims or the objectives of the policy is actually to promote the private sector or to uh, encourage the private sector to take uh, more steps and uh, bolder, I would say, uh, projects and initiatives in this regard. That's why we are working in a kind of uh, some overarching priorities between the different uh, sectors, especially when it comes to collecting data, because uh, yes, we do have several projects mentioned in here, but we need to focus on uh, monitoring the progress of those projects and initiatives, and uh, that will be very necessary or very important to us to know more data about those uh, projects. So it will be really helpful for us, you know, Mr. Kakar, Mr. Jay, Sanjay, that we have some more data about these uh, projects and uh, uh, the relevant, you know, technical details of those. Uh, that will also help us in tackling the second overarching priority that we are focusing on, which is related to R&D, because we, we, we believe that Research and development is very much needed in all of the sectors, I would say, so more work needs to be uh, uh, expedited in this, in this uh, field. The third priority uh, uh, or overarching priority would be related to the integrated waste management. So we have to think about the closed loop uh, concept or the cradle to cradle concept in order to ensure that a waste of one uh, source or one entity is actually a source for another entity and by that we will ensure that we reduce the waste to the minimum as we are planning for. So Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we have wonderful, uh, let's say, uh, discussion points also for the round table. Um, Mr. Kaga, reaction please uh, from your side. So listen, I love the 10, 20, 70 principle. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, if I apply it to where we are, we have the inspiration which is uh, the 2050 inspiration from the UAE. We have the aspiration, which is the new climate and environment policy. And I think it's uh, time for the perspiration. It's time to actually get down and act as industry, uh, bring in all the relevant stakeholders, and, and really uh, you know, hammer out an action plan that over the next five years helps us to meet our, uh, you know, make a substantial leap forward in the area of plastics. I think it's not undoable, it just, if, if we collectively put our might behind it, I'm sure it can be made to happen. Thank you. Time for action. It's also not rocket science. Very good. Um, I hear in my earpiece from the, the studio that we're running out of time. We have to hurry up. So I take one question from, from the room and one question online, and then we we'll proceed with our program. Uh, who can I give the floor? Mr. You in the agenda. Please introduce yourself and please state to whom you want to address the question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karim from the Sustainable City, Your Excellency. We met a few weeks ago. I have a very specific question related to one of the outcomes of the pandemic, which is our behaviors have changed when it comes to consumerism. And uh, we noticed from uh, data collection in Sustainable City that uh, in 2020 and leading up to 2021, 50% of all our recyclables, 50% are just cardboard boxes and paper. And that was you know, up from 30%. So, 
I think that we are inheriting bad habits from the pandemic, and, um, and everybody's just home and delivering everything. So my question to you, even my colleague the other day, I saw her drinking at the office a cup of coffee from Tim Hortons. The question, please. And so I was like, where did that come, coffee come from? Uber. So circularity. What do we do with all this cardboard? How do we push back on this trend? Because it's really, uh, it's really invading our space. And specifically when it comes to Unilever and all that, uh, what do you call it, um, waxed uh, cardboard boxes and, 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 uh, and containers, we really don't know what to do with it. So what's, how do we reverse that trend? So I think that's a question to all three of you. Thank you. So look, um, nobody asked for the pandemic. Uh, it came on us and mm. everybody essentially did what they could to keep the pipeline to consumers going. Uh, you know, consumers were, were just stuck at home and weren't, not willing to get out. Uh, and e-commerce uh, was the only really big solution. We've, we've also seen our e-commerce sales grow tenfold and, you know, contributed to the, to the challenge, you say. Um, I think what I'd like to say is that the challenge is well recognized in the company, uh, and there are a number of solutions which are being put in place in partnership with players like Amazon, et cetera, which reduce the size of the, of, of the cardboard, which creates more value-dense products, so that you know across the value chain, the carbon intensity is, is significantly reduced. Having said that, quite honestly, uh, you know we've all just been reacting over the last 15, 18 months, uh, and I think we are now getting the breathing space to actually just, you know, step back uh, and look at the problem in front of us and, and, and solve it. Because remember, at least companies like ours have the, have the goals. And just because the pandemic came doesn't mean we're going to shy away from delivering our goals on plastics and, and, and carbon. So it's still going to happen. We just now need to take the new reality into account, which has begun. But Thank you. Uh, I don't think I can... I can offer you any immediate thoughts in terms of how we're going to solve that problem. Thank uh, you. We have to leave it with we that. we can't fight against, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And we can discussion, uh, the continue discussion afterwards. Is there a pressing question from the live audience which we need to tackle now? I go to the technical guys. Otherwise, I would say let's, uh, let's continue. Um, what, what, we, what we will do uh, is, first of all, we will thank our panelists for being wonderful spokespersons for their companies, for the organization, and for the country. Thank you so much. Give them a warm hand, please. Uh, <laughs> and I promise you an, uh, an intermezzo. And uh, let's say to strengthen the words of the Netherlands Vice Minister, we can't bring you to the Netherlands, but we can bring the Netherlands to you. Uh, we have uh, a virtual gateway developed by NL on Business. It's a virtual reality showcase uh, in which allows you to experience the Dutch uh, innovations, Dutch solutions to global challenges. Uh, so you, with a virtual reality headset on, you can actually travel through the landscape, experience water management, experience horticulture, experience energy. Uh, this is an experience uh, uh, designed to inspire you. And uh, to have an introduction, we will soon start a little introduction video. Can we see the video, please? Some say it's our inventive nature. But to us, innovation has always been a necessity. In the Netherlands, we let our history inspire integrated solutions for our present and our future through proven partnerships across sectors and between businesses, public institutions, and academia. Growing global challenges require us to come up with even smarter solutions. So let's collaborate with the companies and people behind them. Let's collaborate to implement tailor-made solutions all over the world. Let's collaborate to solve global challenges together. Now let us give you access to these solutions from wherever you are. Presenting the virtual gateway of the Netherlands, powered by NL in Business. Experience leading solutions in energy, water, food, health, tech, and many more. Explore and connect with partners who can fast track your innovation efforts and help you embrace the future. Enter the virtual gateway via virtualgatewaynl.com. Experiencing Dutch solutions has never been so close. 
So, and of course, we'd like to appoint some volunteers for the virtual reality uh, show. Uh, please come forward. Can we share you the virtual reality? So we'd like to thank the audience at home for their presence. We will make sure that all the questions which have been answered, which could not be uh, answered in time by the panel, will be, will be answered and will be sent afterwards. It was wonderful having you virtually with us. Make sure that you are here the next time that you can experience the virtual reality as well. Great to have you with us. Uh, see you back uh, another time.